Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 33. So as promised, we are meeting again midweek after a very full schedule on Saturday, which we didn't get through. But even since then, we have to respond to this dubia, which is on the lips of every Catholic across the world, I'm sure. So we're going to get into that in a moment. But just a reminder, I'm Catholic. I'm not. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still Gavin Ashenden. So, Mark, straight over to you, I think. Can you explain to us what this dubia is? This was a dubia, which is doubts that were presented to the Holy Father from Cardinal Branmuller, Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Iniguez, Cardinal Sarah, and Cardinal Zen, who are Branmuller's 94, Burke 75, Iniguez is 90, Sarah is 78, and Zen is 91. So Burke and Sarah are our two young bucks, and even then in their mid to late 70s. So thank God for them. But can you tell us about this dubia mark? Well, I suppose the first thing to do is differentiate between this one and everyone thinks of the dubia, which Cardinal Burke was also involved with, are following Amoris Laetitia, which the Pope never responded to. He just ignored them. But this is a new set of dubia that they, these five cardinals put forward. And it, it's uh, important to understand that this is just a normal thing in the church. It's not like anything uh, special or particular that's going on you know it, like the, it's a normal thing that when there's um when uh, cardinals want some area of teaching explained that they'll put in a they'll put in jubian to the to the pope so in july they they sent these uh questions five questions and they got an immediate response which was uh quite a contrast to the last one um, and then they weren't happy really with the response. So they they reformulated the question. So the response wasn't in the format, which is normally a yes or a no answer with a, you know, I think usually with an explanation underneath. Um, instead, they were, you know, more with the flavour of Francis. So, um, so they wrote back, reformulated the questions, hoping to get a yes or no answer. And that was in August, and they didn't get a response from the Pope. So um, given the ambiguity of the answers, they decided to post their questions uh, to make them public in the light of Canon 212. And that's basically what the drama is now. Immediately that they did that on Monday, the Vatican, the Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith, took immediate action in posting Pope Francis's full answers. Now, the cardinals said that they weren't going to post the answers because they were private, which might have been, I don't know, I wonder if that was an error of judgment, Gavin, you know, that, that maybe they should have, because it seems, some people have been saying that it seems like they were trying to hide the Pope's answers. Well, I, I mean, having yes, read well, the whole thing were. through, yeah, I think they were, but I think it was to save the Pope's blushes more than to try and obfuscate no, what he was, was saying. It was to say I don't think so. With respect, I think it was because once the Pope's answers were made public, they become part of the, this is the big argument everyone's having, they become part of the church's magisterium. They didn't want to give them a platform for becoming formal teaching. The Vatican outflanked them, punished them by saying, well, okay, if you're going to be this stroppy, suck on this. And 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 the problem is that what the Pope has said in those, it, it, there are two problems. One is there's the impression it changes teaching We'll discuss that. Catherine thinks it doesn't, and she's got a good argument. And the, but the other is, uh, it's still full of ambiguity. There are no there are no guidelines whatsoever for how you would express pastoral generosity to people who come to you. And this this is just sowing confusion and the most enormous difficulty for clergy who are going to be faced with this. And the whole impetus of the LGBT plus movement saying the Pope says you've got to do it, so do it. So Mark, could you give us a brief overview of what the cardinals presented? Yeah, sure. So if we perhaps we'd take them one by one. The first one, basically, was the Cardinals were asking if the zeitgeist dict how we interpret scripture. And I think if you read their question, there's a clear emphasis on the cultural and anthropological. And that shows us that, that the dubium is particularly aimed at the Pope's consistent signalling towards the alphabet people. Um it was interesting that in his response, so then the, so they so they're basically saying, you know, that does what scripture teach change in the light of what's going on in the culture? And in his response, he he 
quotes Dei Verbum 12, which is a bit, you know, like basically it says the judgment of the church may mature. So this is all on that theme that we've repeatedly, we've repeatedly brought up is the development of doctrine, that that's what the Pope seems to be trying to use, that this is a development of doctrine. But his understanding of the development of doctrine isn't in keeping with what the church has always thought the development of doctrine is. So he leaves out, so although he quotes De Verbum 12, I mean, just in that paragraph, it doesn't, that picking out that line doesn't give the, the flavour of what that paragraph is all about because it says the essential context of that paragraph points out that Holy Scripture must be read and interpreted in the sacred spirit in which it was written and that serious attention must be given to the context and unity of the whole of Scripture along with the living tradition of the whole church. Um, there's a brilliant letter on alphabet people that was written by the uh, when the when the DDF was the CDF by um, Joseph Ratzinger, and it's called "If You Google Vatican: The Pastoral Care of Homosexual Persons," you bring it up, and it this is what it does. It centres the whole teaching in that in the continuity of Scripture and the unity of Scripture. I'll put that in the links, Mark. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> So Pope Francis selectively quotes De Verbum here to justify a false development of teaching. And he suggests it seems that's what that's how it seems to me. You know, otherwise I don't know why he's even bringing it up. Um, and he suggests parallels with church teaching. Really, this is the really worrying bit of the first question is that he brings up, and I know you two are going to eviscerate, this is the slavery. He equates it to slavery and the treatment of women, which I just think are really false parallels, you know, and things that we can things that we've dealt with in the church, it's almost like causing a problem to yourself by bringing up these things and saying that church teaching on it has changed because I don't think that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, he for some time he's been making the argument that Mark has presented, which is uh, that the church has been inconsistent and changed its mind about slavery. He's had a number of categories, but basically the, the ones, his favourite ones are slavery, the death penalty and sexuality. Um, he threw in another one at some point. Um, I, I've forgotten what it is, but it'll come back. Um, but the, the problem is, and I, 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 I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm, but theologically, he's just wrong. Uh, he's wrong about slavery because the church's view on slavery has always been the same. It's been an antidote to the power plays of all other civilizations. And because the Catholic Church understands every human <coughs> being to be in the image and likeness of God, no human being is entitled to enslave or to own another human being. Now, what the Catholic Church does with that theology and that principle is another matter because we're in the world and we're surrounded by power politics. I mean, somebody once said, why didn't St. Paul call for the abolition of slavery? And the answer was that there are very many different kinds of slavery in different cultures, but one of them in the classical world was a form of welfare state. And, and, and good slave owners looked after their slaves when, even when they were old and decrepit and weren't worth anything. And so to have called for the automatic abolition of slavery in the classical world would have been to throw thousands, scores of thousands of people on, on, the, on the ash heap. So it's much more complicated than that, but the principle's always been the same and has never changed. And Pope Francis is not right about that. And then there's the business of the death penalty. Catherine, you might want to say something about this because you've been reading Faison and are probably clearer than I am. But what the Pope did was he took the 2018 catechism. So John Paul amended the catechism a little bit in, I think, 91, uh, 97, maybe. But in 2018, Pope Francis slipped into, <laughs> edited the catechism and said that um, in practice, the church was working for the total prohibition of slavery everywhere. This should have caused a huge fuss. People should have said, uh, you, you can't change Catholic teaching by changing the catechism. The catechism is a reflection of Catholic teaching. Uh, and, and he didn't have any right to change it on his own. So this is a huge argument which we're going to find ourselves in now. What right the Pope has to unilaterally change doctrine from development to contradiction? And the reason it was contradiction was because if you're working for the total prohibition of, of the death penalty everywhere, then effectively you're outlawing it. And, and the Catholic Church has always said the state, under some circumstances, has the right to exercise it. Uh, and we might argue what those circumstances were. And that brings us on to sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so uh, the, the argument is, if the church has changed on slavery and the death penalty, which it hasn't, it's entitled to change on death penalty, on sexuality, which is what yeah, it's doing. Exactly. But once again, scripture is extremely, you know, scripture is clear. One of the things that I'm most energized by having become a Catholic is the way I've moved in my own view from seeing Catholic teaching on birth control 
celibacy and chastity. Uh, I've moved from a kind of third rate Freudian, who these Catholics think they are, they're so far behind the times, to realizing that only Catholic spirituality and theology has an antidote to a sex addicted culture, which is falling apart at the seams because it's given up the basic Christian Catholic principle that sex is primarily about procreation. And the problem with the blessing of alphabet coupledom is that it's it's not blessing people one can make the assumption that it's not it's not a blessing is not being offered for procreation <laughs> yes exactly i agree with I you think... that, that slavery has so you're right to to break slavery up into different categories so chattel slavery has never been condoned by the church but what did happen is that um that there were certain times throughout history where individual Catholics, even uh, theologians and writers, were would defend slavery, but the church never did. And so just as today you have individual Catholics, and we know some of them uh, quite <clears throat> prominent Catholics, uh, there's even big groups who 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 make it their, their, their sort of purpose to try and bring in women priests, um, to try and say the church should... Uh, uh, allow abortion it's a human right the church this is not church teaching but there are individual catholics who are saying this is how it should be so the church has never uh, condoned chattel slavery um the death penalty yes this is this, well i said to you in this program a couple of weeks ago i think the the sort of trojan horse of the death penalty is is really leading up to a uh, an attempt to fudge doctrine in terms of sexuality um, I still think that's the case. Earlier, Gavin said, I know Catherine doesn't think the Pope has changed doctrine. Um, what that is to say, I think the Pope is slippery, I'm afraid. Sorry, Holy Father. I might have to edit that out. Um, I think the Holy Father's ambiguity leads people to act in a way and feel justified in acting in a way that is against doctrine without changing doctrine. And I think that lack of clarity is dangerous. Whether we could go so far as to say he's going around changing doctrine um, is another question, but I certainly think the ambiguity is a real problem. And it leads to such things as, you know, you look at the news headlines this week, the Times said, Pope Francis gives women the vote at Synod, primed to enrage traditionalists. Pope Francis says Catholic Church could bless same-sex civil unions. BBC, Pope's address, Catholic could bless same-sex couples. And I have non-Catholics coming to me saying, isn't it brilliant? This Pope, he's making the right moves towards homosexual marriage. He's a bit slow, well, it's going to take time, but he will get there and eventually we'll have women priests. And it's so misleading um, that, in fact, it, 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 this is never going to happen. He's actually saying at the same time it's never going to happen, but that's not what's being heard. And he knows that's not, not what's being heard. And so it's that lack of clarity, again, that is problematic. Um, yeah, sorry, go on, Mark. Well, you just... It, it, uh, it's just one of those horrible things. He, he has to know what he's doing. He has to know that he's playing to the to the audience, and that you know, especially in the. Look, all right, let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> We're jumping off ahead into the well. That so that is question two, isn't it? And I suppose so. That's that's the second question, which asked if same-sex blessings are being given already by many of the church in Luxembourg and Germany, and they haven't been condemned by Pope Francis, then are they, the way that the Cardinals put it is, are they a, a derogation of basic doctrinal principles? Uh, and they put that very beautifully, I think, in the context of scripture. What's he, I think what's particularly interesting about this jubium is that um, even people like Michael Lofton who is, re I mean, really saddened me the, the way that he's trying to carry water for the Pope on this issue and attacking the, the Jubian Cardinals, who are just defending the Church's teaching. Even Michael Lofton had to look at this and say, oh, this wasn't answered well by the Pope. Mm. No, of course it wasn't, because we all know what he's trying to do, exactly as you just said, Catherine. He's trying to slip something under the door, you know, and that really is the problem. Like he starts so out me... by appointing, like as you, so, we've already sort of mentioned that the first thing that he does is points out that marriage is different from other forms of union, and and he says that the church must avoid confusing anything that isn't marriage with marriage. But no one, no one's, you know, like no one's asking him. 
you know. So <laughs> what is he doing that for? Um, he then goes on to give a, a but, it's and the it's three- the but really that is the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's and, and his but is consistent with his modus operandi across the board because it evokes pastoral charity, in which he sets up incredibly an opposition between the defence of objective truth and pastoral charity. Um, And he says that we cannot become judges who only deny, reject and exclude. But no one was saying any of those things. You know, that's not what the cardinals were saying either. No Mm -hmm. one's suggested, no one's recommending that we exclude or condemn anyone or anything like that. Um, And this is what really worries me. When I was reading through the Jubium, so much of it is a straw man argument. Like when in the Pope's responses, he sets up a straw man argument and then knocks it down. instead of actually you know dealing with the questions and i think that's because he doesn't really want to deal with the he doesn't want to give honest answers to the questions because he's trying to push through exact you know they've sussed out what he's doing and they're confronting him with it and so he gives some sort of you know soft, like jesuitical sophistry in response yeah exactly why that's the, that's the question is why is he doing it that's really the heart of the question is why is he being unclear i think the answer Go on, Gavin. The answer is very clear. Well, I've just written an article for the Catholic Herald, which required me to to, to look up um, some of the work of both Pius the Ninth and Pius the Tenth. They both they both wrote against modernism, and they're profoundly moving documents. And one of the things they say there is that uh, the, the modernist technique is always to separate doctrine from ethics, and that's what this answer has done. It's off, it's offering an ethical as in a pastoral uh, response, irrespective of what the doctrinal position is, pretending that you can separate them. In fact, you can't separate them. And what what you do is if you lead with the pastoral or the ethical, then you change the doctrine as you go. This is what the Protestant liberal Protestant churches have done all the way through. And I'm afraid if we're going to argue, is this a mistake or deliberate? um, the, The quality of writing is enormously high. Uh, he's got a team of very gifted theologians working on this. They turned this round in 24 hours. They were ready for it. I mean, it didn't take a genius to recognise what questions that might be presented. The, the five cardinals presented the right questions. The writing team was ready. I think they'd had them ready. I mean, there's one very clever one about synodality later on, where they say, is synodality the right approach? And the, the reply comes, just by exercising your rights to, to, en- to engage in a conversation with a dubia, you are engaging in synodality. So there's your answer. I mean, it was it's it's a very neat rhetorical question. It wasn't dreamt up in 24 hours. And what, so what they've done deliberately is to provide a, a, some very seriously sophisticated uh, argumentation in order to keep the level of ambiguity right at the highest. And then this thing about marriage is the old three card trick. If you've ever seen a magician on the streets doing, asking you to follow the ball under three cups, you're, you're, the, the intention is to distract your gaze. So we're having our gaze distracted as though someone has asked a question about marriage. Yeah. And that gives them the opportunity, though nobody has asked it, to say, we're very much in favour of marriage. Doctrine hasn't changed. So they then get to say to, to repel any questions we ask by saying, but look, we're not we're not changing doctrine. Marriage is the same. We happen to know they are changing doctrine. They're doing it by a different route. They're doing it by the, by the pastoral route. So this is not a mistake. This is a very carefully thought out strategy. And uh, I, I, I have no doubt at all that the decision to release the Pope's replies uh, taken by the Vatican was, was a, a very deft move in order to bring the Pope's teaching into the public space as part of the developing magisterium. Suits them perfectly to have it at the beginning of the, of the Secret Synod because it then feeds into that and people can build on that as indeed they obviously will. So basically, you can tell now why Lardaria has, not, has decided not to attend the Synod, because the Pope is directly contradicting his responsum to the German bishops in 2021, which was that you can't bless gay couples. And, that, you know, the Pope's saying, fundamentally, the Pope is saying that you can. You know, he's saying that you have to pastorally, pastorally discern whether you can bless them in a way that doesn't contradict uh, their relationship with marriage well that's so ambiguous for your average pastor and as you said you know anyone going you know anyone it could it's open to so much uh, abuse 
and it's already going on. You know, we've already got a situation where it's going on in Germany, and the, and basically the cardinals are asking, "Are you going to correct this situation with clear teaching?" And the Pope is saying, "No, it's it's quite up for it." <laughs> It's terrible. I, I, I'm, so that, and that's really, you know, the problem that we've got. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we've got a terrible line this morning, everybody. I'm very sorry. I'll I'll edit as best I can, but there might be some jumpiness and pauses uh, and interruptions. But Ed Fazer's on fire, I'm a, I, I must say, at the moment. He said, he said in response to this, oh, stop it with this nonsense. There's no chin-pulling big theological puzzle here. You might as well say, gee... What if a guy robs a bank to pay for his mum's gallbladder operation? Can we give him some kind of partial blessing in light of this good end? We want to accompany, after all, without condoning the act. Wow, what a pastoral conundrum we'll just have to muddle through and discern. Sheer sophistry. When churchmen give the impression that the church's moral teaching has changed or will be changed, this cannot fail. And that's my point. I think he's giving the impression it can be changed at the moment. This cannot fail to lead some mm -hmm. of the faithful into sinfully acting contrary to that teaching and others to doubt the church's claim to indefectibility. And when sycophants blame only the faithful for being scandalised, but not the churchmen who scandalise them, it compounds the harm. For it reinforces such churchmen, sorry, such churchmen in their dereliction of duty and leads those who doubt into further despair. Quote Matthew 18, 7. Woe to the world because of scandals, for it must needs be that scandals come. But nevertheless, woe to that man by whom the scandals cometh. Brilliant. Well, that's what I was saying to you last night about carrying water. You know, these people are <laughs> carrying water for the Pope and they're desperately trying to prop up a fiction you know I, I don't understand what the point of it is let your yes be yes and your no be yeah. no you know it's if we have I mean I think Jules Gomez said yesterday if you if we have to explain if we have to have some expert to explain what the Pope is saying every time he says something it defeats the whole object of having a Pope the whole point of the Pope is to explain you know Question three asks about synodality. You know, the engagement with synodality is supposed to be to give us clarity of doctrine. And it's almost the, the opposite. Well, who is the obscurer? Who is the scatterer? Who is the divider? You know, it doesn't come from Christ. We've got a Pope who can't even, you know, he's at odds with his own bishops and cardinals to the point where when they speak out like Strickland, the basic truths of the gospel, he sends an apostolic visitation and then talks about removing him. We've got a, a Pope who can't even keep his cardinals in line to the point where they're sending Jubia in because what he's saying is so at odds with the settled teaching of the church. We can't pretend that this isn't a big, big problem, you know, because, and that's just on the, we're watching it from the Vatican. So, and engaging with the theology, you know, we're, we're sort of analysing, you know, going through it line by line and trying to understand where it sits doctrinally with the documents of the church, et cetera, et cetera. But your average bloke in the pews is just going to get a green light. Is it a green light or red light? That's all he's going to see, isn't it? And it's going to be green light. Yeah, that's that. That is exactly the worry. Is is what does it say to the average person in the pews and to those that um, we want to bring into the church? Um, I think that at the heart of this, we say, "Why is the Pope doing it?" Is something that's been called Gavin's used this term before, uh, weaponized compassion. So I want to say a little something about that. Um, there's a dark side to attending to the margins which uh, appears in that story of Judas Iscariot and the woman the, at Bethany, Mary, who anoints our Lord's feet. So in John, is it chapter 12? John chapter 12, the anointing at Bethany, I think. Uh, Mary takes something very expensive and focuses that very expensive thing on worship. So the highest thing she, she puts towards worship. Judas wants to take a good, which is care for the poor, which is a good, and make it into the highest good. He wants to put that good above worship. She should not have used this precious thing to worship Christ, but should instead have given the money to the poor. There's a tendency to make people feel guilty about their own Christian values. So I think this is what we're seeing a lot of, to make them feel that they're very those very Christian values or beliefs are somehow a compromise in compassion. And that if they were truly compassionate, they would actually sacrifice those Christian beliefs. So um, I think it's Jonathan Pajot who spoke brilliantly about this, and he's 
uh, he's got this channel, The Symbolic World, and he talked about the symbolism of this. And he said, there's a film called Silence. Are you familiar with that film? Have you seen it? Yeah, the missionaries who who uh, go to Japan and they... they, they what's that? Warning. <laughs> Warning Jesuits. <laughs> Jesuits, yeah. Well, yeah, so so here we go. So that's even more relevant. So it, it, in the film, these missionaries are sent to Japan. And it's it, there's this realisation that if you torture the missionaries, um, that then there's a problem because the missionaries are willing to die uh, for their faith. But if we torture others, then this puts the right kind of pressure on the missionaries because their own values will compel them to deny their faith <clears throat> in order to preserve the lives of others. The implication in this film is that there is something holy about denying your faith out of compassion. So it's trying to suggest that actually denying your faith, again, it's back to Judas and, and mm. Mary at Bethany and the oil, that you put something above worship. So today there's pressure on Christians to deny their own faith out of compassion. The idea that compromising on your standard would be a more Christian thing to do than to simply love others and be compassionate while holding to that standard. So I just want to bring this to COVID because I think it's really happening. This is really relevant now. So think back to COVID. Out of compassion for others, uh, Christians were told they shouldn't commune out of a desire to preserve the weak and the helpless. We were told that we shouldn't commune. We shouldn't. We should sacrifice our worship. We should sacrifice our singing together. We should sacrifice Holy Communion. We should sacrifice the Eucharist, sacrifice going to confession, sacrifice all the sacraments out of kindness and compassion to others. Um, so this is a really interesting tool, but it's tyrannical, isn't it? Because it goes to the heart of Christians' values. And it tries to set those values up as if the, the, the highest above what is more important. So it's trying to set up the value of compassion and kindness um, above worship and submission to God. And people bought into it. You know, people absolutely thought, isn't this brilliant? Isn't this nice? Isn't this compassionate? We then look at the church and we see before Pope Francis, we had Pope Benedict. So what was Pope Benedict? Pope Benedict wanted to bring back an emphasis on worship. Um, like the woman at the feet of Christ with the oil, this expensive oil that she wanted to use to anoint our Lord. Pope Benedict said, worship must come first. And he brought back this emphasis with um, uh, garments and uh, crosses and use and liturgical, um, you know, types of liturgy and so on. And he did it to show the beauty of Christian liturgical services uh, and the beauty of worship. And he was absolutely eviscerated by the media. Uh, and all these different people who ultimately hate Christianity. He was absolutely eviscerated. And people just lapped it all up and gave in to the narrative. And so along comes Pope Francis. And Pope, Pope Francis is the opposite. So Pope Francis plays down worship, uh, plays down that aspect of worship and plays up instead the social aspect. Um, there's Obviously, there's nothing wrong with the social aspect. But the notion that worship is bad and we're putting something valuable in the service of worship of God is somehow horrible. Um, and then putting putting something else like the social, the, the sort of social aspect of the church above that is a problem. It, it, it's a problem for the right hierarchy. So the right hierarchy is God and worship first. It's the most important thing. Um, and if we don't re-emphasize that right order, if we try to sacrifice the, the top part, the highest good, which is worship, for the secondary part, the secondary goods, which is compassion, then we're going to break down. And so we are breaking down. So social issues are not the highest. They're not higher than our creed. They're not higher than worship. So what I think is happening under Pope Francis, when we look at the, his pontificate compared to Pope Benedict, is Pope Benedict was trying to get that to emphasize that right order. He was never saying, let's not care for the poor. Let's not care about people who are suffering with, uh, you know, the challenge of same sex attraction. Let's not love those people who are sinful, which by the way, is all of us. He was never saying any of that, but he wanted to simply emphasize that worship is at the highest. So Pope Francis is flipping that. And as a result of that, necessarily when you flip that right order, even if you intended it or not, you will then have a breakdown. And that's what's happening is we're, we are experiencing a complete breakdown where we don't know. Uh, we've got people saying, yeah, I'll, I won't bother with the sacraments. I'll let, I won't go near someone and breathe near them in case I hurt the weak. And we've got Judas. And then the other thing is this. 
How can we tell if what's being promoted is weaponized compassion or just genuine compassion? Well, look at the power aspect. And this is something that that Gavin writes a lot about and has spoken a lot about. So Judas in that story is is telling someone off um, for not being compassionate while gaining power for himself, isn't he? So ultimately, it's because he wants the money. So in COVID, what happened is um, the consequence of you not being compassionate is that you feel the brunt of raw power. Yeah, that's what happened. If you if you're not compassionate, you will get arrested. You will get a fine. You will get into trouble. You will be socially excluded. And even in the church, we're saying that, you know, it, the Pope is saying we're going to quash the traditional mass. I'm going to come after Strickland. And so behind that so-called compassion is actually it feels a bit like an exercise of power. Yeah, I like that. It's brilliant. I think it's very good. A couple of postscripts to that. What one is Joseph Ratzinger saying earlier on, we must make it clear the departure from church's teaching or science about it in an effort to provide pastoral care yeah. is neither caring nor pastoral. Only what is true can be ultimately pastoral, which is summing up just what Catherine has said. Somebody else on Twitter I thought was very moving, a woman called Monica something said, so this is the church we've ended up with. Yes, the priest can use his own discretion if he wants to bless a same-sex couple, but no, the priest can't use his own discretion if he wants to say a Latin mass because one is love and the other is absolutely non-negotiable evil. Well, that's the breakdown Catherine's been describing. It's what he's choosing is going to have consequences. And these are the consequences of, of the ambiguity of his papacy, which is a breakdown. And that's what we're seeing. Ed Fazer again says, let's get people I, interested I, in what the church says by not talking yeah. about what the church says and giving the impression that it isn't that important anyway. <laughs> Yeah. One of the ways of doing one's philosophy or theology is, and in any conversation is always to go back to first principles, because if you can discover the, the, the hierarchy of values somebody holds, then you, you can see why they're arguing. And having held Pope Francis's position for 15 years, I understand what he's doing. He thinks he's doing something very kind, very generous, very healing to the marginalised, uh, and, and that everything else takes second place or third place. But in fact... I think epistemologically he's wrong. Uh, I I came to see that the, the 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 most important value is holiness. If you if holiness doesn't come first, nothing else falls into place. Which I think was what Cardinal Rattinger was saying about the truth. So our interpretation of compassion cannot displace the quest for human holiness. It, it's already too difficult anyway. <laughs> um, but but there's a great danger that our our pastoral concerns will get really caught up with our own psychological disorder, our need to be loved, our need for people to accept what we say, our need not to suffer by apparently being nice. And I think, therefore, that, that this is an entirely deliberate strategy. And one of the things they've done so cunningly is to is also to weaponize public opinion. So by throwing this out into the media ways, in the phrase, in, in the sense that the Catholic Church is now loosening up on the whole alphabet thing, this produces an enormous response from the media and from the world saying, yeah, this is great. Exactly. So all the all the agnostic Catholics who are quite secularized and don't know what they're doing are thrilled. And if you like, there's a groundswell of opinion taking up and articulating much more clearly than 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 the, the response that Dubia has this whole liberal uh, program. And they've done that deliberately on purpose. And it's really very dangerous. Um, and we know why they've done it, but they're mistaken. Mark. Well, and I think, yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's uh, also a massive burden for parents. You know, it, like because all these people are going to see it as the church catching up with the times. You know, that's the way it's going to be. Oh, at last, the church has caught up with the times. Instead of the wonderful teaching that we have got, and and which is so important um, to get that across, and the Pope is not interested with any of those issues. The issue that we're facing in society with the family or any or the over sexualization of our culture um and instead he's completely prepared to just capitulate um at, because it makes him popular i suppose i mean i just have not uh, maybe you know maybe you say like you say Gavin, he believe but um it is extraordinary so if you're a parent and you've got a child who suffers from same sex attraction uh, how on earth do you deal with this the same for all those um, 
chaste and wonderful Catholics who are, who are same-sex attracted, who've been living their lives according to church teaching. What, do we throw all that out the window now? Is it basically saying that, I mean, it's just, the, the repercussions are, they really do make me want to cry when I'm, you know, when you yeah. think, hmm. think of, like the, it's so I, awful. I think one of the things I and want he to say. He talks sorry. about compassion, but he's no compassion for the faithful. Oh, that's it. <laughs> that's me done. Rent over. It's like I just, exactly. I'm just saying didn't that he's mean, got no touch across the faithful. I... Yeah, yeah. Mm. I would say as well that I think the way to deal with this is to, like, you know, we need to. So it's important that we talk about it and that we we discuss the issues. I think it is really important for our individual. Or view the way that I deal with it is by focusing on the fact that our faith is about building a relationship with Jesus and transform that doesn't so the way that we pray the way that we worship the way that we live doesn't change and that still brings the same incredible rewards as it always has done irrespective of what the the man in white in Rome is saying um and you know, you know we do talk about what the Pope is up to. So um, I don't know, do you want to move on to, and have a little look at the other questions? Because I think they are, they bring up interesting points as well. Um, the third, the third question was about, okay. So point three. So the, the third question asks, is synodality the supreme regulative criterion of the church? And as Gavin mentioned earlier, it's really, Michael often calls a, a mic drop moment where he suggests to the cardinals that by engaging with asking questions, they're engaging in synodality, like in the process of synodality by doing that. But um, I don't, you know, I think what it's extraordinarily naive to suggest that that's the case because in reality, the, the synod has been hand is a hand picked minority, you know, it's so it's it's very different from. Um, the College of Bishops, because it is a small amount of people who have been very much handpicked by the Pope to bring up these particular topics. Now, the Pope is saying that, you know, um, give, bring these issues to me. These are the issues in the church that we're discussing, and I will teach on them. You know, that's sort of what he's saying in his, in his response. Uh, that's a very weak argument, you know, because what we need is for, you know, to be affirmed in the faith. That's what Jesus asked Peter to do. That's the job of the Pope. And what he needs to do is to give us clear understanding, not talk about all the things, all the people, not get all the people who disagree with what the church says in a room and give voice to all of their concerns perpetually. You know, and so what so can he really mean that? Can he really mean that he wants to give voice to all these contrasting opinions? And what value has that got to us as a church? You know, uh, the problem is that the gospel mm. isn't being preached. The gospel isn't being preached, that the truth of the gospel has been obscured by the culture for the last 50 years or so, definitely. And it needs to be given more clearly. And instead, the Pope, as we've just, you know, just to reiterate, um, you know, he, the problem is that he has ignored these all of these issues and instead focused on more popularist issues like the environment and migrants and all these things at the great expense of the gospel message being being preached. So his his response there was was or the response of the draft theologian was very clever and entirely misleading uh, in by saying you're engaging in the snodal process. It was mistaking, confused, deliberately confusing status and function. So in terms of the function, yes, a conversation is synodal, if that's what you mean. But the status of the cardinals is not the same as the status of the synodal gathering. And that's what the cardinals really were asking. And that was obscured by the by the by the clever reply, which was designed to win an argument, not to actually tell the truth again. So and, and Mark Mark's right, um, the problem. But the reason they've start done the secret synod is precisely to weaponize and energize public opinion uh of the public opinion of the public that they want and having gathered the momentum of that kind they'll then use it for, uh, as an argument for changing doctrine and even if the pope is right even if we say okay that is what he's trying to do he runs a tremendous risk of getting everyone you know and this has been said by 
um, Archbishop Dermot Martin, the retired Archbishop of somewhere in Northern Ireland, or somewhere in, might have been Dublin, anyway. And he basically, you know, I think I mentioned it the other day, that he said that we run the risk of building up people's hopes and then dashing them. If, if you know, if, if he's being honest about it, what he's saying, and he doesn't intend to try and smuggle a change in, then all he's going to do is upset everyone by saying, well, you know, thanks very much, everyone, for telling us what your hopes Yeah and dreams are but they're all a load of rubbish because this is what the church teaches well he might as well have just skipped the whole consultative process and just told them what the church teaches from the beginning mightn't he i can't see what the benefit is of it so it's it's to me it just seems obviously disingenuous from the beginning <laughs> so the irony is that that's the best case scenario that he that the pope can sell us in his in his answers here is that that's what he's trying to do that's the best case scenario which is just awful so the fourth one is about the female ordination, which I know, you know, which is just, and that, uh, that astounded me, his answer in there, because he, he, he says that it's not a definitive statement. You know, when we know that it's a def, it's been, def, it's, it's been, and this is one of the big things, you know, I was sort of, I brought up on Twitter yesterday, the fact that previous popes, or, you know, even with the Henry VIII controversy, um, Pope Clement VII wouldn't, undo what a previous pope had done and that it wasn't even a doctrinal or a, a dogmatic or a magisterial pronouncement it was just what the previous pope had decided he wouldn't undo it and uh, you know i mean not to cast aspersions on clement the seventh i'm sure he was a very holy man but we know that a lot of the popes have been despots you know it could easily have been the case in that period of, you know i don't think it ended well for him <laughs> but you know it could easily have been the case that you know, he wasn't worried about any kind of dodgy behaviour. But the principle that he did maintain was the fact that you don't contradict previous teaching. You know, even the Borgias didn't mess with the doctrine. And Pope Francis continually is undermining the church's teaching. And he's undermining the teaching of previous popes. Can he not see that this is undermining his own authority? You know, as I've like, you know, I've said it previously, if he just starts changing everything the Pope did before, for example, with Traditionis Custodes, surely that just opens the door for the next Pope to come along. If Pope's at all, you know, then what's the point of the papacy in any... I mean, I just think the damage that he's doing is absolutely massive. And when he tries to explain this, he <laughs> says that, um, well, we have to start... Yeah, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about female ordination. Because the Anglicans have got female priests. So, you know, I mean, what on earth is he on about? What is the benefit of that? Yeah, but it's nonsense. Oh, and again, yeah. it, it's nonsense. And again, it's the same as what you were saying before, um, which is, well, it, what it, it's not going anywhere. You will not see women ordained ever in the Catholic Church. So women who have set up their whole lives to to march and devote their lives to and organise groups and to get funding and to go about promoting and to do PR and to seek support for women's ordination, give up. Don't bother. It's never going to happen. And the reason it's never going to happen is so deep and rich and historical and traditional and beautiful, by the way, that I don't see why, say, I don't understand how we can come to this simple, well, the Anglicans have done it and they're talking about it, so we've got to. To what end? To what end? It's not going to happen, so it's just wasting people's time as far as I can see, and I think that's a real shame. Uh, I thought that, um, <laughs> uh, I thought that, first of all, the argument, this particular point, throws up the contrast between over-indulgent compassion and holiness. Holiness requires repentance. Jesus put holiness first always. And, and when there was repentance, then there was forgiveness. So I think one of the things this does is to remind us of the, again, the right, the right ordering of epistemological value. Holy first and compassion comes after it. Why, why didn't Francis mind saying that? I think the answer is because um, he's not going to change the, uh, the climate of opinion. Um, by talking about the way in which confession happens. I, 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 this article I wrote trying to explain, I thought, what the way in which he was 
using contradiction and pretending it was development began with a quote from 19 from, sorry from 2013 on the world youth day to the to the world youth and he said i want you to cause a mess i want you to go into the dioceses and cause trouble effectively let's cause a mess together and i think that's what he's done doing it was notionally in the name of getting rid of rigidity and clericalism and institutionalism and many things that slightly mar occasionally the the institution of the church but again you have to define what they are and you have to know what you're dealing with but i'm afraid i think he's just a bit like a bull in a china shop he's bit he, he, i don't mean to be rude but there's an, as an aspect of, of arrested adolescence about him let's go and create a mess let's go and cause trouble let's throw everything up in the air and perhaps it'll come down right well unfortunately yeah. it's not coming down right uh, and i'm i'm just glad that he left he's left confession alone and perhaps reminded us by that the, the dubia remind us that actually uh, what takes precedence over indulgent compassion and the answer is the quest for putting things right for god yeah and I, th I don't think anything that he's done has gone right either is it you know like when you look at the papacy he certainly has made a mess you know absolutely it doesn't seem to me that any of his projects have worked out and all they've done is caused ambiguity confusion and you know that like the china thing is just an absolute disaster that, and it's facilitated evil to gain more ground. That's how it seems to me, because that voice of clarity and truth that the church should be in the world has been completely absent because he's been quite willing to keep quiet about atrocities in order to appease the dictators that he's trying to do a deal with. Ostensibly, that's the, the excuse that's given by the Vatican. I mean, it's just a, a appalling on every level and has been a a failure as far as I'm I'm concerned. You know, you see it on the ground in terms of catechesis, uh, in terms of people leaving the church. It's just a I don't think that you can which is what upsets me about the apologies for, for Francis that they're trying to carry water by going into the minutiae and trying to argue in the points. But even then, you know, as I say, that you, you can tell that they can see that there's ambiguity and, and problematic statements. Um, it's just a, a bad time, isn't it? It's a bad, big old mess. Yeah, I think they, this is part of the problem, is that there is clarity to be found, and even looking at uh, Pope Francis' verbatim responses to the dubia, there is some clarity to be found. But the fact that you have to dig deep, and the, the, the media, the secular media, aren't going to be digging deep, which is why you're then presented with headlines saying Catholic Church will bless gay couples. Um you shouldn't have to. It should be really clear. And that should be the most because then all the rest of it just fudges it. And it may, as you say, what my frustration is as a Catholic parent and as a Catholic teacher and working with young people, my frustration is it's it's then left for us to pick up the pieces. And it shouldn't be that way. It's really it's really just disheartening, I think. And we should be strengthened in our faith to defend our faith and to reveal the beauty of our faith without constantly trying to bend to the spirit of the age and and you know say well the anglicans are talking about this and well people want to to be loved and whoever the catholic church is never god is love it's never said people aren't to be loved it's never said people are perfect if they're christian and aren't they horrible if they're not it's never said any of these things but the way to the way to to help people to see that is to make it clear what the church has always taught well i think that we have to think what's the purpose of what we're doing. Raising, raising the questions is and, and discussing them is, is some of the battle, but it's certainly not all of it. So I certainly feel, uh, and I know you two probably do too, that actually we need to buck up. You know, I mean, we're, we we I okay, me, I, I need to really buck up. I go to mass, I try to go daily, and I get to monthly confession. Okay, step it up a bit, girl. You know, uh, go pray your rosary, pray your novenas, fast and offer up and, and try and make a change by striving for holiness in your own life. I think it is important that we talk about these things as well. I think Pope Francis gives us the mandate to do so with his uh, spiel on synodality. <laughs> yeah. So here we are engaging with the synodal process ourselves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Don't take what I've said and uh, and hear and things... half hear it. it. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it. We absolutely must. But I'm saying it's part of a bigger picture that... But I can only speak about myself. I think I need to 
really ramp up and and not forget that actually our own prayer life our own sacrifice our own fasting will have an impact uh, it really will but we must do it especially when times are dark even more so sorry gavin yeah, it's essential uh, well I, I, that's a that's a, a perfect foil to what i want to say which is more general and that is i'm always aware of hearing people's criticism <laughs> starting when i became a catholic into the fire and uh, what i want to say is that the spiritual and philosophical struggle <clears throat> that has destroyed anglicanism and most of liberal protestantism is simply moving its target onto the catholic church it's exactly the same struggle expressed in slightly different language occasionally but we are facing a struggle for the life and the integrity of the church as pope benedict saw when he was cardinal ratzinger foresaw <laughs> that we were going to find ourselves in a in a very punishing fight with the local culture and what i want to say what i need i need to hear for myself and i think other people need to hear too is that there's hope um jesus said don't be afraid i've overcome the world uh, and i think we're not to be afraid we're simply to accept our vocation which is to bear witness the fate of the church is ultimately in his hands all he asks us to do is to keep the faith to practice it and to say our prayers and that's what we're here to do. We're not going to panic. We're not going to stop being Catholics. We're not going to let the faith go. We're not going to allow any of this to mask our love for Jesus uh, and our dependency in him. Uh, we're in a lot of trouble collectively, but it's not our fight. We just need to keep true to the vocation he's given each one of us. Oh, man, that's beautifully that's said. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And Gavin Ashenden, God bless you. Like and share if you be so kind. <laughs>